House Committee on Environment and Energy. Energy, and this morning we have a little change. Agenda. Um, so our first witness had a different time on his schedule than what we had on ours. So we will transition into a committee consideration of the amendment that we heard from Representative Durfee yesterday morning. And I'll just give an update, which is that 10 of his members are sponsoring that amendment or co-sponsoring that amendment. So they are sort of, and one has chosen not to. So that's, that's the news I know about the amendment. And um, I'll make, I'll just let you all know that I support it. I think it's uh, good. It's just clarifying some of the things that I think we already intended in our bill. So um, I would, I'm wondering where Laura is. I haven't seen Laura. She's here. here. Okay. Is she aware that we're meeting? I'm surprised. Yeah, that'd be great. She's right out there. I'll text her. Does anyone have any comments or on, on this before we <coughs> go through it? Can we comment on it before we're live? <coughs> no, I meant for it. We are live. We are live. Okay. Yes. <laughs> he matched us up perfectly. Can I comment on something? Yeah. <laughs> on uh, page four. You know, I, I just. Seth, I, come on and join us. She's on her way. <laughs> I discussed this a while ago on this work. So, sorry, just, can you start over? Yeah, I can. On uh, line four, uh, page four and line 10, it starts the land, waters, and forests. You're in the old one. Yeah. one Yes, he's a full one. Yep. So that's all nor that's all the same language. I know it is. Yeah. Okay. What page? Page four. Sorry, I'm slow this morning. Four. Or do you want just comments on the amendment itself? I mean, we're talking about the amendment right now. Then I'm then I'll work. I'm fine. Okay. Um We are um, talking about the H-126 amendment as presented to us yesterday by Representative Durfee. And the update that I was, I have is that <coughs> the committee has a, 10 of its members have signed on to it. Um, one has not. And so what we're doing right now is discussing it if we need to. Um, there has not been any discussion. Or not. We still need to discuss it and then indicated my support for it. And... I'm looking for a motion of, not a motion. I mean, we'll do a straw poll when folks are ready. So I've read it and uh, it's a great solution. But uh, together really well. Yeah. yeah. Good. Same. Okay. All right. So I guess I'll do the straw poll and say, is, um, any, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Nine, I think, and to all those opposed. This is, may I ask a question? This is, this straw poll is strictly on the amendment it and is. not the bill. It is. Okay. I, I, I'll, I'll support the amendment. Okay, so that's 10 to 1. 
proposed 10 1 on a straw poll. Great. Um, the other update, well, actually, Laura already knows because she was the one that ran into Senator Bray yesterday. Um, so I think we have, um, we also need to discuss the bottle bill amendment. And so um, we have Michael O'Grady coming in at nine. And I, we could wait until nine to do that discussion if it would help members. If you have clarification questions on the on the amendment, it would certainly help the legislative <laughs> council with us. Um, if members have other general comments they want to talk about before Michael gets here, we could go right into it. What is your pleasure? Yeah. Well, just to be um, clear, um, we had the amendment presented, and I think the consensus of the committee, just to remind people where we are, we've all remember this, but was that we were fine with a lot of the amendment, but not with the part that took out the escalator, and we had that extra language that we talked about for um, making it 50 percent or whichever is greater with regard to the sheets after the five years. Uh, so those two things, I think, were the areas where we wanted to re-amend their amendment. Yeah. We should do a plain escalator today. The escalator was the measure in the bill that uh, let's shoot the bottles at let's just use bottles or five cents right now. Yeah. And came <laughs> Whatever. Um, and that if we don't hit the targets, anytime we don't hit the target, it's enunciated in the bill for two years, then it automatically goes to 10 cents. The same with the wine and liquid goes to 20 um, if we don't hit the targets. And we had originally talked about just doing that. And then the industry would, you know, prefer that we didn't. And we thought, okay. What we really care about is if we're hitting the targets. And if we hit the targets and we can do that at five cents, fine. Um, but if we don't hit the target, then we go to 10 in order to do suck the redemption rate. And we, we took out, we had a much larger, as the longer, we had other steps in it, but we took, we, we narrowed that down to just the, um, just the one time in each instance. So <clears throat> this, are we going to hear any more testimony on this? No, it's not so much testimony yeah. as it's just deciding what we, so, you know, so my read of the room, not the whole room, but I don't know, whatever, was that that was, that was, that felt like the consensus to me is that we wanted to stick to our initial way of doing the, the escalator. Representative Saxon. I did have an additional, a couple additional thoughts around that around those topics. And one was that when we talk about the amount of money going to the Clean Water Fund, the money that was proposed um, in the amendment was $3 million as a, as a minimum. Um, and they got, if, I, if I understand it properly, that money, that amount was, take, was, was created, um, was figured out as an average over what the last few years was. But if I remember right, the amount of money going to the Clean Water Fund has been sort of slowly increasing over the last few years. And so taking an average would actually be sort of a hit to the, what it would have otherwise expected to get over the next few years. And so um, I would propose increasing that number to something which would better reflect um, where that fund has been going the last, and sort of what the trajectory has been. We can we can ask Michael O'Grady when he comes in um, if if my recollection is right about where those numbers have been so going. If you're talking about an increase, do you mean like instead of going to from five to ten cents? Are you are you talking about I'm talking about million? the amount of money going to the the Clean Water Fund? Right. And the average over the last few years has been about three million dollars. But if I remember right, that, that amount actually has been more in recent years. I think it's more like three and a half million dollars. That's what it has hit recently. Well, the amendment proposes the first four million. Three and then four. Oh. Okay, let's look at which. It starts off at three million on January 1st, 2026. Okay. And then it goes to four million once. But when it comes, yeah. when it comes back and 
<laughs> when it gets expanded, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. 30. Yeah. <laughs> it would be good to look at those numbers to make sure that the water fund is. is does, you, does anyone know where the three million goes when it goes to the clean water fund? Specifically, or is there no specific spot where it does go? Right. It goes Most into like the fund, fund, and then and that fund gets allocated by the um, water board. By the land sampling committee. Um, well, there's a clean, no, the agency of natural resources chairs a committee that oversees the funds okay. and where they go. I think it'd be great if we could err on the side of making sure the clean water fund has more money than we've otherwise had rather than possibly less. Um, except that the remainder goes to the solid waste management account, which uh, to me is a really strong nexus to the need. And we need that solid waste management account also to be addressing solid waste issues. I thought, I thought a big chunk of that was going back to the PRO. For a time. For a time. Yeah. Right. So that's which really what I'm we talking had about it. is that during that time. Right. right. Well, did they change the 50% to the PRO? No, I don't. There's still it's still fifty percent, but they pointed out that fifty percent might mean that the clean water fund gets less than what it has been getting, which I think is an, an important note. And so I'm just sort of going from there and saying, yeah, let's really make sure it doesn't get less than it would have gotten in the next few years by by in, increasing that that base amount that that they're gonna that they're gonna get. And if they can get if they get more because they get a lot more um, unclaimed deposits, then fine. But make sure that we're not putting less money into there than what would have other been <laughs> otherwise have been the case if we had not passed this bill. Others have thoughts on this? It, this is going to be really difficult for me to. <laughs> This is going to be difficult for me to support because of the issue of movement. So, which part is difficult? <laughs> That's it. Don't be afraid. Which one is it? The Odium and I think what I'm going to recommend is we take a break until nine. All right, we're going to reconvene our meeting with our legislative council, Michael O'Grady, to look at the Ways and Means Amendment uh, Draft 1.3, March 16th, 4:28 p.m. Same one we walked through earlier in the week. Um, Michael, we had just begun our discussion of this, and uh, I think we're okay. Uh, well, I'm going to speak for myself. I'm okay with most of it, but we did check in ways and means on the putting the escalator back in um, before we, do members have questions for Michael on that particular part of the amendment, <coughs> the escalator part of it? Is this, excuse me, mm -hmm. just the one dated 428, 4 p.m.? Um, mine? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, 428 p.m. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, Representative Stevens. Thanks, Andrew. I guess a question um, to Ledge Council would be, uh, was House Ways and Means aware of the fact that we had already sort of made it, made concessions already to the PRO in terms of, you know, it had started it even more of a requirement that the escalator would occur? Like, for me, this is as... I would like to see the escalator back in, and I'm wondering if they knew that that was already sort of a part of the give and take process. No, I don't think that the fact that it was a higher deposit amount, I don't think that was discussed. No. Thanks. Is it okay with us making the change? Do members have, um, I mean, as Representative Bongard's kind of teed up before the break. Um, it seemed like folks were in favor of returning back to the escalator that we had gotten to. Just, is anyone opposed to that? 
And Michael, that would be part, we would like to offer an amendment. Um, okay. Putting that back in. I'll offer it. Um, me or the committee or Christy? Christy, do you want to offer it? Or the committee? I, I can. My own Seth and I were talking about it. I don't want to exclude anybody, people. Can it be a committee amendment? Uh, no, you don't have possession of the bill anymore. Okay. So you could put all your names on it, and that's that's a that's that de facto committee bill. Uh, I don't have a problem with money. Seth, I don't have a problem with money. <laughs> but either way, if, if, you, if you're overwhelmed and would rather that one of us did it, that's, that's not fine. a bad idea. But if, but if you're, <clears throat> but actually, there's reasons why I think it. Yeah. What's up, Christy? Let's, let's, uh, Christy yeah, I think and you're the reporter of the bill. Well, yeah. um, although, I mean, I'm, 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 if everyone's willing to have or in, with whatever wants to have their name on it, is there anyone that doesn't want to have their name on it? Let's put all our names. Yeah, let's put all of our names on it. Okay. Christy can give our, you know, yeah, present it. Um, Representative Pat. Yeah, I agree with doing this. My only hesitation that I've had is it's it's pretty unusual for a back and forth kind of dispute between two committees. One, you know, no, no dispute. Yeah, no, I don't think there's a dispute. I think it's it's sort of to what Gabrielle's point was, um, and that that this is um, kind of a policy decision that we had had vetted. Okay. Just. I just my one comment. I was going to say this earlier. We were, we went offline, but the responsibility for the redemption system is going to be the stewardship program is going to be stood up through the PRO, and it's their responsibility for educational standing up at additional redemption centers, et cetera, and more, uh, more timely pickup, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to keep the responsibility with them, and that's where this initiative. If they don't do what we're asking them to do, then the automatic inflator goes into place if the percentages are down. So right. <clears throat> reason it's it's keeping the foot on the gas pedal for the PROs. Yeah. Yeah. Not for monitors. Um, and then there's one other instance of amendment is there that, that South would like to offer. Um, it was in their amendment where they had it on a permanent basis, the clean water fund getting $4 million once it goes. And when uh, Carol was in here, and I think we have our representative already was in here, and I think this is okay with the Ways and Means Committee as well, just to add the words or 50%, whichever is greater. Is that section 3A? Oh no, that's the deposit amount into the. It's, it's yeah, you know, section three C one C C one C one section three subsection C one. I see. Yep. So line four, four million dollars, or fifty percent, whichever is greater. Yep. That's permanent. Okay. Wait, is that where it is permanent? Because this is also the part where returning to the PRO, which is only temporary. That's the three. So I think you want to make the permanent change. Yeah. Section 3A and 10 BSA 1530. Yeah. Million right. of the 50%, I would say. 50% of the abandoned beverage container deposits for the first 4 million of the beverage container deposits, comma, whichever is greater into the clean water fund. Right. Yeah, because that's the permanent. That's the permanent. Yeah, okay. that's where it needs to go. Thank you. That's 2031. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. 2031. Yeah. Oh, the year. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like looking for a section. <laughs> yes. Long a ways out. Can draft that? That would be great. Um, any other questions or comments on this amendment for, for Michael before he goes? 
I'm not seeing any, so we will appreciate the work on this. All right, we're reconvening our meeting with our legislative council to review our proposal of amendment to the ways and means proposal of. This is Michael Grady with the Fox Legislative Council. What you have in front of you is an amendment to the House Ways and Means proposal of amendment to the bill as you proposed it to be amended. The first instance of amendment um, is uh, in section 110 BSA, chapter 53, and section 1534. You are striking the subsection C that the Ways and Means Committee added that would have required uh, the Secretary of Natural Resources to report to the General Assembly with the current beverage container redemption rate and a recommendation of whether the General Assembly should enact legislation to increase the beverage container deposit. In its place, you are reinserting the language that you passed out of your committee, which would read beginning on January 1, 2028, Secretary determines that the redemption rate goal established in subsection A of the section was not met. One or more of the beverage container categories listed under subsection B of the section for two consecutive years. Beverage container deposit for the category shall increase by five cents, provided that the maximum deposit for any beverage container category shall not exceed 20 cents for bonus beverage containers and liquor bottles and shall not exceed 10 cents for every other container. In one year following the secretary's determination under the sec section, manufacturers and distributors shall comply with the labeling requirements in section 24 of this title before assessing the relevant deposits published under the subsection for the beverage container. And then the second instance of amendment, you are amending section 3A, which was added by ways and means. Um, I don't have the amendment in front of me, but basically what you are doing on this in the second set in September VSA 1530 C1 is that I, I wanted to, I, I struck some language that I probably didn't need to strike so that when I reinserted the language, it was clear how it read uh, because it, the way that I originally started doing it, it just wasn't reading very well. So I struck some of the language that I didn't need to strike so that it basically reads as a sentence. Um, so I struck, uh, shall deposit the first 4 million of the, bend, of the abandoned beverage container deposits into the clean water fund. And I reinserted, shall deposit 50% um, or the first 4 million, whichever is greater, of the abandoned beverage container deposits into the clean water fund. And then I started that sentence by saying the commissioner of taxes annually shall deposit um, because that wasn't very clear from the language to begin with. You mean on line four, the annually? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That, I agree. That was not clear. Thank you for catching that. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, what will happen if, if the beverage container amount is not met? Uh, Deposit will increase by a nickel uh, per bottle, wine bottle, and per container. After that goes into effect in the event that it does and has to be increased, what's going to happen once that goal is achieved in the following year and fire exceeds what it achieves? Will the deposit go back down? No, there is no. There's no back and down. It or no. <laughs> Should there be? Well, I think the theory would be that it took the increase to get it to where it needs to be. Okay. And there's a there's a pretty good amount of time before this would happen because it's two years, right? <laughs> it's like a it's it's pretty um, conservative, if you will. It's in its implementation if the legislature doesn't want it to happen the legislature will have plenty of time to legislate again yeah. seems better than defaulting to having us legislate yes. <laughs> great thank you uh are there questions on this amendment um michael so all of our names are on this we don't need to vote on it you still have to vote on it i would i would, I would recommend that 
because you may be asked what the vote was. Okay. All right, great. Thank you for this. Um, all right, so. Um, this is actually our amendment, so it's in our possession. And so I would ask, entertain a, a motion to uh, support the amendment. So moved. Representative Sackowitz moves that we approve this amendment as written. Is there a second? Sorry. Representative Stevens. All right. Um, with that, the clerk commence to call the roll. Representative Bonnards. Yes. Representative Clifford. Yeah. Representative Logan. Yes. Representative Morris. Yes. Representative Pat. Yes. Representative Sakovas. Yes. Representative Sibilia. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. Representative Stebbins. Yes. Representative Tory. Yes. Representative Shelton. Yes. That is 11 zero zero. All right. Christy, since you're the reporter, you can bring this to the clerk. She right? knows it's coming. Great. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Michael. Yes. Then do a storm. Assuming our um, we're amending our amendment. Yeah, we do need to do a straw poll on their amendment, the rest of their amendment. Yes, actually, could you run mm -hmm. us through exactly what the sequence is going to be today? The, the on today? the floor. This is, I'm sorry, on the floor with this, with 158. Oh, it'll be like any bill where Christy will start with the underlying strike call amendment that we have of the bill, which is our bill. Right. And then Ways and Means got the bill next, so their amendment will be presented. And then Appropriations got it next. There's, if they change anything, which I don't know that they are, and then our amendment, this one, to amend their amendment. And then debate always goes in reverse order also. So it goes back up. So it starts with, I guess, probably our amendment, and then works its way back up the chain. So that's a fair question. Right. It's supposed to be Tuesday. That was uh, the initial word I got from the speaker. So I guess our straw poll on the proposal of the Ways and Means Amendment as amended yeah. <laughs> by us mm -hmm. is what we need to do a straw poll on. So I do a straw poll. Sorry, um, <coughs> do a straw poll on both. We just did a vote on this. We just did a, an official vote on this because we have it in our possession. And we do not have theirs, it's their amendment. And we just do straw polls on things we don't have in possession. No, I'm sorry. Oh. I meant um, we need to do a straw poll on both eventually, assuming, let's say, our does like us. That would happen. We have to offer some opinion back to them on mm -hmm. 11. Mm -hmm. They're unamended. I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's by the case support it. <clears throat> yeah. I think we'll cross that bridge if we come to it. So what I'd like to do before we shift gears is say, do folks support the Ways and Means amended amendment as amended by us this morning? All those in favor, signify by raising your hand. All right, seeing 10 hands, uh, 11 hands in favor of the Ways and Means Amendment as amended by us. So folks, um, great, thank you. <coughs> Representative Stebbins. Uh, so presumably Representative Morris has to send this official vote as well. Um, when he when he brings this to the clerk, send this to the clerk. Bring it or send it. Send it. Email it in the same manner you do the bills. Yep. And, and I'm reporting the amendment in the vote list. Right. Yeah. 
So, yeah, and today it would be great to do Yeah, I'll do it right off. I was just wondering if, do we have this by email? I think Michael sent, sent it. Did he get send it, Kate? Right. So, yes, we do have it. It should be actually posted. Uh, need a PDF, Kate? I, I may have to refresh it, all. So. Great. With that, um, we'll shift gears and welcome our Legislative Council, Ellen Tchaikovsky. Join us, and um, everyone has a hard copy of S5 in front of them. Thank you, Kate, for getting the copies. And um, we're going to do a walkthrough. I think, you know, we'll, we'll go for 40, 45 minutes, take a break, and then come back. Members, this is a long bill. It'd be really great to get through it before we dive into any policy discussions today. If you have clarifying questions about the, the wording of something, we will, um, but now is a good time to get clarification on those, but please limit your questions to that for now. Oh, I'm turn my sound off. I heard a bird in the finger. We're good to go, Alan. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's like 10 o'clock and we're feeling that. All right. So today, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council, S5 as passed by the Senate. Um, I did also, I can't get on the internet, so I can't check, but I did also send Kate the S5 as passed by Senate summary and the timeline. Um, we can talk about those at a, at a different time. It is not, the, the summary document is not a true section by section. It's a little bit different. It's a really high level um, overview of each individual section, a one sentence. So if you're ever looking for something in this bill, that can be a, a resource. Um, but I'm gonna start with a walkthrough. Uh, as passed by the Senate, it is 38 pages. Uh, as passed by Senates don't have line numbers. So I apologize if anyone, if I lose, if I lose you, let it, I'll stop and I'll make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, but to start, S5 is an act relating to affordably meeting the mandated greenhouse gas reductions for the thermal sector through efficiency, weatherization measures, electrification, and decarbonization. Uh, section one is a short title. Uh, it may be known and may be cited as the Affordable Heat Act. You have already heard some things about this. Uh, last year, the legislature patched, passed H-715. That bill was vetoed by the governor. That was the starting point for this bill, and so it has a lot of similarities from that, but it also has a, quite a few differences um, that the Senate worked on. So the, the structure is largely the same, but there are some differences in it. The section two is the finding section. Um, there are two small changes in it from last year's section that I will point out, uh, but the General Assembly finds, one, all of the legislative findings made in the 2020 Acts and Resolve Number 153, Section 2, the Vermont Global Warming Solutions Act of 2020, the, the GWSA, remain true and are incorporated by reference here. Under the GWSA and 10 VSA 578, Vermont has a legal obligation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to specific levels by 2025, 2030, and 2050. The Vermont Climate Council was established under the GWSA and was tasked with, among other things, recommending necessary legislation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The initial Vermont Climate Action Plan calls for the General Assembly to adopt legislation authorizing the Public Utility Commission to administer the clean heat standard consistent with the recommendations of the Energy Action Network's Clean Heat Standard Working Group. On to page two. As required by the GWSA, the Vermont Climate Council published the initial Vermont Climate Action Plan on December 1, 2021. As noted in that plan, over one third of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions in 2018 came from the thermal sector. In that year, approximately 72% of Vermont's thermal energy use was fossil based, including 29% from the burning of heating oil, 24% from fossil gas, and 19% from propane. To meet the greenhouse gas emission reductions required by the GWSA, 
Vermont needs to transition away from its current carbon intensive building heating practices to lower carbon alternatives. It also needs to do this in an, to do this equitably, recognizing economic effects on energy users, especially energy burdened users, on the workforce currently providing these services and on the overall economy. Vermonters have an unprecedented opportunity to invest in eligible clean heat measures with funding from new federal laws, including the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2021 and the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. So um, uh, findings number five and six are new to, to S5. Uh, uh, Five was added by the Senate Natural Resources process. And seven, uh, number six was added by the Appropriations Committee. Uh, they were very specifically interested in recognizing the federal money that's going to be available for much of this work. I will pause briefly and just say that um, typically in drafting, uh, findings are not always necessary. Um, but findings do have a specific use in bills. They are typically uh, necessary when there is a um, the courts look to findings to look as one of the places where legislative intent is established. And so the findings here are very um, closely linked to the mandated requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and that is why there are many references to them here. Um, and so you did hear yesterday, I believe, from a uh, an attorney from the attorney general's office, uh, as they, if they ever were to work on a case related to this law, this is one of the areas they would look for as part of the analysis in that case. So section three at the bottom of page two starts the statutory provisions of this bill. It establishes chapter 94 <clears throat> in title 30. Title 30 is where um, most, if not all, of the energy law is, is uh, established, and it um, is the area that are, those are within um, UC's jurisdiction and Department of Public Services jurisdiction. So at the bottom of page two, intent is the first section. This is 8121. Pursuant to 2 VSA 205A, it is the intent of the General Assembly that the clean heat standard be designed and implemented in a manner that achieves Vermont thermal sector greenhouse gas emissions reductions necessary to meet the requirements of 10 VSA 578A 2 and 3, minimizes costs to customers, and recognizes that affordable heating is essential for Vermonters. It shall enhance social equity by prioritizing customers with low income and moderate income and those households with the highest energy burdens, the clean heat standard shall, to the greatest extent possible, maximize the use of available federal funds to deliver clean heat measures. So a couple things I do want to point out here. And the, the first intro language is pursuant to 2 VSA 205A. So this is a reference, an existing reference in statute that um, directs committees to establish their intent and make known their legislative intent when they're directing rulemaking. So LCAR in recent weeks have really been focusing on trying to make sure that um, when LCAR does its review of legislative uh, of rules that have come from administrative agencies, one of the things they're supposed to look at is whether or not the rule meets legislative intent. And um, often committees don't necessarily include a statement of legislative intent. And so this entire section is, is in um, the, the purpose is to have something that LCAR can look to um, when they're reviewing the rules that come from the PUC. And um, so this is acknowledging um, for, by including that statutory reference. Um, but that's also why these, this, these uh, sentences were added in the first place that LCAR could have something to review. And then um, there's another statutory reference, which is to 10 VSA 578A 2 and 3. You'll become very familiar with these if you already if you aren't already. Uh, 578A2 is the requirement that uh, our emissions be reduced by 40%. Nope. That's the 2030 deadline. Yeah, it's it's 40% from the two, it's 40% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. Uh, see you. 
I should know them like the back of my hand, but those references are throughout. And so there's an acknowledgement that the Global Warming Solutions Act establishes these deadlines by the 2030 emissions reduction and then the 2050 emissions reduction. And so this is what this bill is, is aiming to align with. All right. Oh. All right. What are we waiting for? Oh, quick question. Oh, Representative Tory. We heard yesterday, but I can't remember. Is it 1990 or 2005? I don't remember off the top of my head. It's one of them. I'm sorry. Right down. I think in the 40 to 80 in 1990. Was it? It was a higher percentage from 2000. I'm sorry. There's a lot of other numbers in my head yeah. this morning. I'm going to get a whiteboard board and write them. Yeah. The they are on my on the wall in my office. <laughs> they are not in front of me. Um, so section 8122 uh, is the introductory set introductory section to the clean heat standard. Um, any of you are familiar with the renewable energy standard? Uh, the language in this chapter in S5 is um, Mo, uh, resembles it structurally in, in a lot of ways. And so, um, so 8122 establishes the basic principles of the clean heat standard. So A, the clean heat standard is established. Under this program, obligated parties shall reduce greenhouse gas emissions attributable to the Vermont thermal sector by retiring required amounts of clean heat credits to meet the thermal sector portion of the greenhouse gas emission reduction obligations of the Global Warming Solutions Act. By rule or order, the commission shall establish or adopt a system of tradable clean heat credits earned from the delivery of clean heat measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. An obligated party may obtain the required amount of clean heat credits through delivery of eligible clean heat measures, through contracts for delivery of eligible clean heat measures, through the market purchase of clean heat credits or through delivery of eligible clean heat measures by a designated default delivery agent. An obligated party shall inform the commission how it plans to meet its obligation through the process described in section 8125 of this title. The commission shall adopt rules and may issue orders to implement and enforce the clean heat standard program. Question. Representative Morris. Uh, just a brief confirmation of what obligated party is. Oh, we are going to talk so much we about are? that. Okay, I'll hold my question. So much. It is going to be on the next page. All right, thank you. Obligated party broadly, though, are who this bill, who are bound by the terms of this bill. It is the core concept of this bill of who are the obligated parties. Thank you. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and it's the Public Utility Commission shall adopt rules and may issue orders. Yes. Such as? So we are gonna talk about, we are gonna talk about that. all of this. Okay. This okay. is the overview section. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. Yeah, it you. really yeah. is the high level. It's the highest okay. level. Everything I just mentioned has detailed sections coming up. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for anybody that has an answer. If we have questions on her explanation of this bill, you're not the one we want to ask questions of, but will there be someone back in here so that we can ask questions and get answers on, on S5 before we do anything with the bill? Yeah, and if you have questions on this, clarification questions on the wording or what this is trying to do, you can ask. ask exactly. Them. All right. Thank you. So the next section is 8123. This is the definition section. Uh, and there are some, some highly technical definitions in here that you will probably want to hear more about. As used in this chapter, number one is carbon intensity value. So I will say this is a new concept that is being introduced in this bill that was not in last year's bill. It means the value of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions per unit of energy of fuel expressed in grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per megajoule. How much carbon is a type of fuel emitting per gram? We're gonna come up, this is gonna be used uh, very specifically later in, there is a, or it's used later in the, in the bill, so we'll get to that. Number two is clean heat credit. So that is a 
tradable, non-tangible commodity that represents the amount of greenhouse gas reduction attributable to a clean heat measure. The commission shall establish a system of management for clean heat credits pursuant to this chapter. Uh, so the easiest way I think to think about a clean heat credit is, is that it is similar to what a renewable energy credit is. It represents something about the technology. Um, and here it's expressing the amount of greenhouse gas reduction attributable to whatever that technology is. It's another big concept. It may be, so it's, it says here that the, the commission is gonna establish a system of these. Um, so we're gonna get to that as well. There's an entire section on that. Clean heat measure. So this is another big concept in this bill. Fuel delivered and technologies installed to end use customers in Vermont that reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the thermal sector. Clean heat measures shall not include switching from one fossil fuel use to another fossil fuel use. The commission may adopt a list of acceptable actions that qualify clean heat measures. Again, there is an entire section on this later in the bill. The commission meets the Public Utility Commission. Uh, number five on page five, customer with low income means a customer with a household income of, of up to 60% of area median income as published annually by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Customer with moderate income means a customer with a household income between 60% and 120% of area median income by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Oh, Representative um, Logan. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanna uh, flag these definitions here um, because we had testimony from Secretary Moore yesterday and she gave us some information about the number of households that fall under the 120% of area or, um, so she was using a different standard, actually. She was using household median income as a standard. That was the information that she got from the tax department. Um, and this is the AMI as published by HUD, which has regional, um, and household composition different differences from the household median income standards. So I'm really curious to find out how many households yeah. this represents and what percentage of each. Thank you. Uh, number seven is a default delivery agent, which means an entity designated by the commission to provide services that generate clean heat credits. This also has its own section and is a significant part of the bill. Energy burden means the annual spending on thermal energy as a percentage of household income. Entity means any individual, trustee, <clears throat> agency, partnership, association, corporation, company, municipality, political subdivision, or any other form of organization. Fuel pathway. Fuel pathway means a detailed description of all stages of fuel production and use for any particular fuel, including feedstock generation or extraction, production, transportation, distribution, and combustion of the fuel by the consumer. The fuel pathway is used in the calculation of the carbon intensity value and the life cycle emission, greenhouse gas emissions of each fuel. So again, this is tied to this new concept related to carbon intensity value. Heating fuel means fossil-based heating fuel, including oil, propane, natural gas, coal, and kerosene. On to page six, obligated party. Okay, so obligated party, as we're going to get into in the next section, is who is required to comply with the requirements of the clean heat standard. So it, <clears throat> obligated party means a regulated natural gas utility serving customers in Vermont. Or for other heating fuels, the entity that imports heating fuel for ultimate consumption within the state, or the entity that produces, refines, manufactures, or compounds heating fuel within the state for ultimate consumption within the state. 
for purposes of this for the purpose of this section the entity that that imports heating fuel is the entity that has ownership title to the heating fuel at the time it is brought into Vermont so who owns the heating fuel when it crosses the state line into Vermont for ultimate consumption in the state who is going to be obligated under the clean heat standard Who owns the fuel at the time it enters the state is obligated. Yes. Is that a quiz question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Future quiz question. Yeah. Uh, Representative Tori. That um, similar to Oregon and what they have with the transportation fuels? Yes, actually, I think it is almost identical. And this language is actually nearly identical also to what we, how the state of Vermont identifies who owns the fuel in the gasoline and diesel in the transportation fuel sector. Um, for taxing purposes, this is uh, the language that already exists elsewhere in statute for that. Mm -hmm. And then the final definition is the thermal sector definition, and it has the same meaning as the residential, commercial, and industrial fuel use sector as used in the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast. So just, just a point of clarification, uh, back up to uh, B. Uh, other heating fuels, the uh, the obligated party. So at the time it is, enters the state, so say a distributor has a depot in New Hampshire in a fuel delivery corporation company that's going to deliver to the homeowner, goes and gets it and comes into the state. Yep. Who owns it? Whoever owns it when it crosses the border. So be the delivery and from what the testimony was in the Senate, it can, it can happen in many different configurations. So whoever owns it when it crosses the state line. And I'm sure that we are going to spend a whole hour at some point just the Senate Natural Resources Committee spent a significant amount of time thinking about the different types of companies and the different models that they use. Um, but this is a very neutral way of expressing whoever owns it when they come to bring it into Vermont for consumption in Vermont. They're bound by this. So section 8124 is uh, sets up clean heat standard compliance. So now we're going to start talking about some of the details. Required amounts. The commission shall establish the number of clean heat credits that each obligated party is required to retire each calendar year. The size of the annual requirement shall be set at a pace sufficient for Vermont's thermal sector to achieve life cycle carbon dioxide equivalent emission reductions consistent with the requirements of the GWSA in 578A2 and 3 expressed as life cycle greenhouse gas emissions pursuant to 81 27G, which is later in this title. So what we're saying here is that the commission is going to establish an annual amount that each obligated party needs to meet by retiring clean heat credits. Uh, that amount is going to be based on the emission reductions required in the Global Warming Solutions Act. So the first one being 2030, 40% emission reduction by 2030. So they're going to need to look at uh, the existing greenhouse gas uh, emissions inventory and uh, figure out how much needs to be reduced each year and how much each party needs to reduce each year to meet our GWSA requirements. Page seven, annual requirements shall be expressed as a percentage of each obligated party's contribution to the thermal sector life cycle CO2E emissions in the previous year. The annual percentage reduction shall be the same for all obligated parties. To ensure understanding among obligated parties, the commission shall publicly provide a description of the annual requirements in plain terms with translation services available. Um, so this is similar to how the renewable energy standard is set up, where every year utilities are required to increase their amount uh, of renewable energy in their portfolio by a certain percent, and it's the same percent for all of the utilities. This is a similar structure. So um, 
the PUC is going to set a percent by which each needs to reduce their emissions every year, and it will be the same percent for each based on their annual sales of fossil fuel. Number three, to support the ability of the obligated parties to plan for the future, the commission shall establish and update annual clean heat credit requirements for the next 10 years. Every three years, the commission shall extend the requirements 10 years, assess emission reductions actually achieved in the thermal sector, and if necessary, revise the pace of clean heat credit requirements for future years to ensure the thermal sector portion of the emission reductions under 578A, 2, and 3 for 2030 and 2050 will be achieved. So at all times, uh, obligated parties will know 10 years out what their emissions reductions are going to need to be. The commission may temporarily, for a period not to exceed 18 months, adjust the annual requirements for good cause after notice and opportunity for public process. Good cause may include a shortage of clean heat credits or undue, finan undue adverse financial impacts on particular customers or demographic segments. The commission shall ensure that any downward adjustment does not materially affect the state's ability to comply with the requirements of 578A, 2, and 3. Representative Sibelia. We had uh, in the last version of the bill several circuit breakers, if you will, like places where if prices were going awry or something was happening, this is one of those circuit breakers. Yes. Yeah, and I'd say minimal changes have been made to it. Um, the Senate Natural Resources Committee added that phrase, a period not to exceed 18 months. Um, to say um, if you're going to reduce the amount of credits people need to provide because there has been a financial impact, it should only be 18 months, and then there should be a reevaluation um, so that the Global Warming Solutions Act requirements can continue to be worked towards. But yes, if there is a shortage of credits or uh, financial impacts on customers, this is one of the areas that allows the PUC to reduce the requirements. Go ahead. Undo means? So undo is a two, well, two step. So adverse financial impacts, there can be some adverse financial impacts, but undo is exceeding that. So if there is too much uh, adverse financial impact. So on to page eight. Annual registration. Each entity that sells heated fuel into or in Vermont shall register annually with the commission by an annual deadline established by the commission. So I just wanna say right there, the word that's being used here is entity. So this is anyone who sells heating fuel. Um, it's broader than just the obligated parties. And this is just for the registration requirement. Um, and part of this is because currently the heating fuel sector is um, unregulated by the PUC. And so this is part of the, the overall data collection that's going to happen uh, so that there can be a, a big picture of who in the state is selling. Um, it's not going to obligate everyone who sells heating fuel because um, there are... Um, there, there are heating fuel operations of various sizes and structures, but anyone who sells need to register so that um, there can be a sense of the universe of heating fuel that's being sold and who the different sellers are. The first registration deadline is January 1, 2024, and the annual deadline shall remain January 30. January 31, 2024. It shall remain January 31 of each year, I guess, unless a different deadline is established by the commission. The form and information required in the registration shall be determined by the commission and shall include all data necessary to establish annual requirements under this chapter. The commission shall use the information provided in the registration to determine whether the entity shall be considered an obligated party and the amount of its annual obligation, annual requirement. At a minimum, the commission shall require registration information to include legal name, doing business as name if applicable, municipality, state, types of heating fuel sold, and the volumes of sales of heating fuels into or in the state for final sale or consumption in the state in the, ca in the calendar year immediately preceding the calendar year in which the entity is registering with the commission. 
The Department of Taxes shall annually provide to the commission a copy of the forms that were submitted by the entities that pay the existing fuel tax established in 33 BSA 2503A1 and 2. If any form contains a social security number, the Department of Taxes shall redact that information before submitting a copy of the form to the commission. Notwithstanding any other provision of law, including 33 VSA 2503C and any confidentiality provisions that would normally apply to tax forms, the fuel tax form submitted under 2503 shall be public documents and the commission shall make those documents publicly available. The Department of Taxes shall ensure that the fuel tax form required under 2503 includes a prominent notice explaining that pursuant to the section, the form will be provided to the Public Utility Commission and will be publicly available. The Department of Tax shall further ensure that the fuel tax form requires that each submitting entity list the exact amount of gallons of fuel type of gallons of each fuel type separated by type that was sold in Vermont, as well as a list of exact amounts of gallons of each fuel type separated by fuel type that was purchased by the submitting entity and the name and location of the entity from which it was purchased. So there is an existing fuel tax on heating fuel. Uh, the uh, heating fuel sellers currently pay this tax to the Department of Taxes. Um, and so they have a lot of information that would be useful to the PUC as they begin to set up this registration system to know how many gallons of heating fuel are sold in the state and by whom and what the different fuel types are that are sold by each entity. And so this is requiring sharing of data between the Department of Tax and the PUC, as well as making sure that the data is um, available that's separated by type of fuel and gallons for each. I think I may have missed this, but you started this section talking about how not everyone who sells fuel will be an, have to be an obligated party. So what's, what's the cutoff? Who owns the fuel when it crosses into the state? So who, I thought you just meant like a volume or a like. Nope. So, so it is yeah. it is um, the person who Brit, who imports fuel into the state. Yeah. So they would all be obligated. Yeah. Yeah. So there will be people <coughs> lower in the distribution chain. Who didn't import the state into into the state directly themselves? Oh, I see. So they won't be obligated. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, at the bottom of page nine, each year and not later than thirty days following the annual registration deadline established by the commission, the commission sh shall share complete registration information of the obligated parties with ANR from the Department of Public Service for purposes of updating the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast and meeting the requirements of 591B, which relates to the inventory and forecast. So again, greater emphasis on data sharing so that all of our information um, is accessible to those who are doing the calculations about whether or not the GWSI is being achieved. On page 10, number five, the commission shall maintain and update annually a list of registered entities on its website that contain the required registration information for any entity not registered on or before January 31, 2024. The first registration form shall be due 30 days after the first sale of heating fuel to a location in Vermont. Clean heat requirements shall transfer to entities that acquire an obligated party. So if they purchase someone else's business, they take on their clean heat requirements. We have a question. Julia? Yes, going back to the tax forms. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> when we think about fuel, and it has multiple purposes. So how is that fuel counted? Um, how do we, how is that fuel's purposes counted? Is it bifurcated in any way, or is it just counted as a type of fuel? So the bill is specific to uh, heating fuel. Um, the fuel form itself, I don't think mentions fuel use. Um, but that um, the PUC is going to develop the form. Um, and so I think it's possible that the PUC's registration form would potentially would ask for fuel use on there um, that hasn't been 
detailed too much here. I do think that there is overall a intent that only heating fuels be captured as part of this process. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, number eight, entities that cease to operate shall retain their clean heat requirement for their final year of op operation. Section C, early action credits. Beginning on January 1, 2023, clean heat measures that are installed and provide emission reductions are creditable. Upon the establishment of the clean heat credit system, entities may register credits for actions taken uh, started starting in 2023. Um, we're starting to get into some of the details. Um, so that date has already passed. Um, the system has not been established yet, but in theory, if this bill were to pass, it would be established sometime later in this year, at which point people who have done clean heat work already this year will be able to register their credits, um, which could then be sold to entities that will need to purchase credits for the first reporting year. Um, so this is making sure the market um, can get started and that credits can start accruing before the market actually goes live with the launch of the clean heat standard, um, which at the earliest would be 2026. <coughs> right, subsection D is a big section, equitable distribution of clean heat measures. The clean heat standard shall be designed and implemented to enhance social equity by prioritizing customers with low income, moderate income, those households with the highest energy burdens, and renter households with tenant paid energy bills. The design shall ensure all customers have an equitable opportunity to participate in and benefit from clean heat measures, regardless of heating fuel used, income level, geographic location, residential building type, or home ownership status. On page 11, number two, of their annual requirement, each obligated party shall retire at least 16% from customers with low income and 16% from customers with moderate income. For each of these groups, at least one half of these credits shall be from installed clean heat measures that require capital investments in homes, have measure lives of 10 years or more, and are estimated by the technical advisory group to lower energy bills. Examples shall include weatherization improvements and installation of heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and advanced wood heating systems. The commission may identify additional measures that qualify as installed measures. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about a lot of this later in depth, but basically what's going to happen is that um, hypothetically, the, the public utility commission is going to set an annual requirement for an obligated party somewhere, maybe say, 6% of emission reduction required. Of that, and that will need to translate into credits. Of that required amount, 16% will need to come from uh, customers with low income, and 16% will need to come from customers with moderate income, as defined at the beginning. And then of those credits, half of them need to come from installed measures. And what that basically means is they can't come from the use of biofuels, which is the other primary um, category of clean heat measures. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, when you're referring to uh, low income and moderate income, is this one set low income and one set moderate income for all Vermonters? Yes. Or is it prioritized into counties? Um, so, uh, it's anyone in Vermont that meets the definition of low income and moderate income. So those are separate categories, um, and it could be from anywhere in Vermont. All right, thank you. Is is your question the same? The definition is the definition of those two categories the same county by county? Um, so the definition is the same, but I think as Representative Logan mentioned, it um, does differentiate. Uh, the amount is different based on the county. So it's not an equal, it's not going to be equal across the state then? The, pers the dollar amount that a household would need to earn is different based on what county you live in. 
Mm. Representative Logan. Thank you. And also, how many people? How many people live in the household? Yeah. Sure. Right. So I, I guess what I was getting at there is someone with a low income in Chittenden County can make more money than someone with low income in Orleans County and still be considered, uh, no, I, I guess low income in Chittenden County might, might be, say, $50,000 for a family of four or whatever. Uh, and Orleans County, that same low income might be considered $30,000. So does that mean the people that are making $50,000 will have more of an advantage to get more things free out of the clean heat standard than they will in the Northeast Kingdom? The definition of uh, area median income that is set by the U.S. HUD um, has acknowledges the regional differences of the cost of living. And so they are different numbers. And so, yes, Chindon County is a different number than other counties. Um, and there are people who work in this area of, of um, policy and law that can definitely speak to what that translates to. Um, but the HUD numbers were chosen because that is a um, very well-known number set by the federal government um, that fluctuates based on um, uh, you know, inflation and such. And so that's an annually adopted number by the federal government. Um, and it does acknowledge regional differences. Yeah. Thank you. I have a hard time understanding that because a dollar in, in Burlington is 100 cents. And a dollar in Island Pond is 100 cents. That's, that was just my point. I, I, that just seems a bit odd. That's all. Thank you. I think we're going to talk more about that. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, so number three, the commission shall consider front loading the credit requirements for customers of low income and moderate income so that the greatest proportion of clean heat measures each uh, reach Vermonters with low income and moderate income in the earlier years. With consideration to how to best serve customers with low income and moderate income, the commission shall have the authority to change the percentages established above uh, for good cause after consultation with the equity advisory group and after notice and opportunity for public process, good cause may include a shortage of clean heat credits or undue adverse financial impact on per, uh, particular customers or uh, demographic segments. And so again, like the earlier provision, again, the, the PUC has some authority to uh, reduce the amount of credits required if uh, there is a shortage of credits or undue financial, undue adverse financial impacts. Representative Sebelius. Second circuit break. That's what I seem to say. Yeah. Uh, number five on page 12. In determining whether to exceed minimum percentages of clean heat measures that must be delivered, so customers with low income and moderate income the commission shall take into account participation in other government sponsored low income and moderate income weatherization programs. A clean heat measure delivered to a customer qualifying for a government sponsored low income energy subsidy shall qualify for clean heat credits required under subdivision. Uh, so can we just uh, uh, ask a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, number five. Yep. Uh, when we talked about Participation in government-sponsored low-income or weatherization, it can be stackable. That, that's what that's saying. Um, so that's not what that's saying, but that is stated later in the bill. So this uh, number five is referring to the fact that on the prior page, um, it does ask the, the commission to consider increasing the required amounts from low income and moderate income. Um, and so in looking at that, they should consider whether or not there is um, participation in other government-sponsored low-income and moderate-income weatherization programs. So if, for example, um, this is re like really uh, deep in the details of this bill, but uh, if, for example, uh, so 16% of credits are required from low-income customers, but there is a very large uptake in like LIHEAP, one of the other programs that shows that there is a significant, significantly more amount of customers that could potentially be in that category. That's one of the things the, um, the, P the PUC should look at is how many other customers are using other low income programs. 
And then six slightly relates to that in that it says um, customers who are already qualified for those low income programs would automatically fall into the category of, lo of low and or moderate income customer um, so that there's a, a bright line um, before the full program gets started. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can you, is there a definition for government sponsored? Nope. There isn't? No. Okay. Uh, just a question. Okay. okay, go ahead. No, I kind of know what government is, but thank you. Uh, so on page 12, subsection E, credit, oh, I'm sorry, seven. Um, customer income data collected shall be kept confidential by the commission, the Department of Public Service, the obligated parties, and any entity that delivers clean heat measures. I think we're going to take a break now and uh, come back at, um, I guess, 11. Uh, yeah, 11, top of the hour. We're going to reconvene our meeting and continue our walk through the S5. All right, so on page 12, uh, subsection E, credit banking. The commission shall allow an obligated party that has met its annual requirement in a given year to retain clean heat credits in excess of that amount for future sale or application to the obligated party's annual requirements in future compliance periods as determined by the commission. So this currently happens in the uh, renewable energy standard process where if a utility has uh, more RECs than they need, they can bank them and use them in a future year. Um, and so this is establishing that for clean heat credits. Enforcement. <clears throat> On to page 13. The commission shall have the authority to enforce the requirements of this chapter and any rules or orders adopted to implement the provisions of this chapter. The commission may use its existing authority under this title. As part of the enforcement order, the commission may order penalties and injunctive relief. Um, if at some point you want to hear more about this, the existing authority is under, I believe, three, uh, 30 VSA 30. And the PUC does, uh, with the other things that they administer, um, have penalty authority and then injunction relief. And injunction relief is when you... Um, stop a company from operating. So if they are in violation of the law, an injunction can be issued so that they have to stop operating until the court rules otherwise. Uh, number two on page 13, the commission shall order an obligated party that fails to retire the number of clean heat credits required in a given year, including the required amounts for customers with low income and moderate income, to make a non-compliance payment to the default delivery agent. The per credit amount of the non-compliance payment shall be four times the amount established by the commission for timely per credit payments to the default delivery agent. So we're gonna talk about this more in an, upcoming session, in an upcoming section, but the commission is going to set the price to be paid per credit to the default delivery agent if the company is gonna choose that option. Um, and so then if a company um, fails to uh, have the required number of credits, the penalty is four times the credit price to the, D, to the DDA. Representative Pat. Is that for the amount of credits that they're short? Is that? Yes. Okay. okay. Yep. And that does include the required amounts for low income and moderate income customers as well. Um, and we will hear later that the money um, accrued from that process is going to go into a fund for, uh, well, it's going to fund low income, uh, work for low income customers. Number three, false or misleading statements or other representations made by, to the commission by obligated parties related to compliance with the clean heat standard are subject to the commission's enforcement authority, including the power to investigate and assess penalties under this title. The commission's enforcement authority does not in any way impede the enforcement authority of other entities such as the attorney general's office. Failure to register with the commission as required in this section is a, is a violation of the Consumer Protection Act in 9 VSA chapter 63, which is an example of something the attorney general's office would enforce. 
Go to page 14, records. The commission shall establish uh, requirements for the types of records to be submitted by obligated parties, a record retention schedule for required records, and a process for verification of records and data submitted in compliance with the requirements of this chapter. Reports, as used in this subsection, standing committee, standing committees means the House Committee on Environment and Energy and the Senate Committees on Finance and on Natural Resources and Energy. After adoption of the rules implementing this chapter, the commission shall submit a written report to the standing committees detailing the efforts undertaken to establish the clean heat standard pursuant to this chapter. <clears throat> On or before January 15th of each year, following the year in which the rules are first adopted under this chapter, the commission shall submit to the standing committees a written report detailing the implementation and operation of the clean heat standard. The report shall include an assessment of the equitable adoption of clean heat measures required in subsection D of this section, along with the recommendations to increase participation for households with the highest energy burdens. The provision of 2 VSA uh, section 20D, expiration of required reports, shall not apply to the report to be made under this section. And so this is requiring an annual report on the clean heat standard um, and it shall not expire. So you will always, you'll get that report every January. Page 15, section 8125, default delivery agent. This is one of the changes from last year's bill. Um, this, the, uh, the format of the default delivery agent has changed somewhat from what was passed in H715. So A, default delivery agent designated. In place of obligated party specific programs, the commission shall provide for the development and implementation of statewide clean heat programs and measures by one or more default delivery agents appointed by the commission for these purposes. The commission may specify that appointment of a default delivery agent to deliver clean heat services on behalf of obligated parties who pay the per credit fee to the default delivery agent satisfy those entities corresponding obligations under this chapter. So this bill is setting up that the obligated parties are required to have a set number of credits each year. And one of the options for these obligated parties is to go straight to the default delivery agent, who is someone who, uh, is, which is going to be an entity that uh, we'll talk about more, but the PUC will appoint this entity to be doing clean heat work basically year round at all times so that there's always an option for a company to have someone doing clean heat work. And the PUC is gonna um, set the price that is going to be paid to this default delivery agent. So number two, appointment. Yeah, but quite, but how does that work with a four times penalty if they don't? <clears throat> In other words, they're going to be required to somebody's a default company is going to do the alternatives. Yep. But the, the company is going to be the obligated party is going to be penalized four times if for lack of. And so that's setting up an incentive that a, mm -hmm. a company should uh, figure out early on what their plan is to get their credits. And if they're going to be short, they should go to the default delivery agent sooner rather than later, because if they are short on credits, they're going to have to pay four times as much right. as they would normally. Representative Smith. Thank you. So this sounds like it's going to place quite a big burden on fuel companies. <coughs> or am I correct or not? I can't answer that question. <clears throat> it sounds like it's going to be additional additional work for them to make sure that they don't make mistakes so that they're not fined. So Brian, we're gonna just try to focus on understanding it. Well, that's what I'm trying to do, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, anytime you establish a regulatory process, there are, um, you, the, you will need to learn how to comply with a new law. And so I think that that is a similar thing that happens with any bill that you pass that sets up a new regulatory scheme. Okay. So appointment, the default delivery agent shall be one or more statewide entities capable of providing a variety of clean heat measures. The designation of an entity under this subdivision may be by order of appointment or contract. A designation 
whether by order of appointment or contract, may only be issued after notice and opportunity for a hearing. An existing order of appointment issued by the commission under section 209D of title 30 may be amended. D? Oh, sorry, <laughs> getting ahead of myself. Section 209 of title 30 um, may be amended to include the responsibilities of the default delivery agent. The section 209 is the energy efficiency, sets of energy efficiency programs. Uh, 209D is one of the specific provisions of that, but so, uh, currently, there are three entities that have been appointed under 209. They are Efficiency Vermont, Burlington Electric Department, and Vermont Gas Systems. An order of appointment shall be for a limited duration not to exceed 12 years, although an entity may be reappointed by order or contract. An order of appointment may include any conditions and requirements that the Commission deems appropriate to promote the public good. For good cause, after notice and opportunity for hearing, the commission may amend or revoke an order of appointment. So uh, the details on, the, there are a lot of um, details on this next page, but what you should know is that um, the language in this section is different from last year's section. Um, last year, the bill contemplated having an existing market participant who, do, who did clean heat work, um, and they would essentially be hired as the uh, alternative option for clean heat services. Um, this is setting up that an entity can be appointed, um, and it could be a new entity, or it could be one of the it could be at least one of the existing efficiency utilities. And so the language on page 16 is going to mirror the language that exists already in Title 30 uh, related to the efficiency utilities. And so what this means uh, broadly is that um, the PUC regulates utilities. And it also regulates the efficiency utilities specifically, and that they have a under that existing authority, they have a substantial authority to um, review all of their their budgets and their documents and all of their operating documents, as well as have access to their facilities and have the authority to um, interview and question um, any of the directors of that entity. And so they have a lot of direct control over how that entity is operating. Um, and so that is setting up this for the designated default delivery agent. And so the PUC will have um, pretty close control over the budget of that entity and therefore how much they're charging for clean heat services. So supervision, any entity appointed by order of appointment under this section that is not an electric or gas utility already regulated under this title, <clears throat> shall not be considered to be a company as defined in section 201 of this title, but shall be subject to the provisions of sections 18 through 21, 30 through 32, 208, 205 to 208, subsection 209A, sections 219, 221, and section 30, uh, subsection 231B of this title, to the same extent as a company as defined under section 201 of this title. Um, and so I can get you all those exact uh, citations, but those are to the, those are the PUC's authority to have a, a direct, direct regulation over covered entities, including a utility or an efficiency utility. The Commission and the Department of Public Service shall have jurisdiction under those sections over the entity, its directors, receivers, trustees, lessees, or other persons or companies owning or operating the entity and all of its plants, equipment, and property that, entity, that the of the entity used in or about the business carried on by it in this state as covered and included in this section. This jurisdiction shall be exercised by the commission and the department so far as may be necessary to enable them to perform the duties and exercise the powers conferred upon them by law. The commission and the department may each, when they, de when they deem the public good requires, examine the plants, equipments, and property of any entity appointed by order of appointment to serve as the default delivery agent, a default delivery agent. It's a law. It is a lot. And so uh, Senate Act did contemplate that this would be a entity like Efficiency Vermont. 
from use of the default delivery agent on page 17. <laughs> An obligated party shall meet its annual requirement through a default a designated default delivery agent appointed by the commission unless the obligated party elects to meet its requirement in whole or in part through one or more of the mechanisms pursuant to subsection 8122C of this title. So this is another change. Um, this is strongly suggesting that obligated parties should go to the default delivery agent. Um, last year's bill had more of a, you can pick any of the four options. The four options being an obligated party does clean heat work themselves, or they contract with an entity that does clean heat work like a contractor, um, or they buy credits on the open market, or they go to the default delivery agent. And so this is setting up, it is strongly encouraged that they go to the default delivery agent unless they elect to meet uh, their requirement through one of the other ways, and they have to tell them that. And so that's in section two here. So the commission- Let's make sure I understand it. So if they go to the default agent, does that mean simply paying for the credits? Or yes. Okay. okay. Yep. <clears throat> Yep, and they can do that in whole or in part. And so I'm going to lay this out, but they can, um, they're going to need to have a plan and tell the PUC what their plan is. Um, if they think that they can buy credits for a certain amount, but then they want to go to the default delivery agent for the rest of that, that would probably be fine under this as well. So there's flexibility here, but the PUC wants to have some idea of how the obligated parties are planning to do this work. Representative Smith. Can you tell me how, <laughs> I'm, I'm still stuck on this, but how are costs and values of credits going to be determined. We're going to get to that. I hope so. <laughs> thank you. It's a significant part of this bill. All right, thank you. Yeah. So the commission shall provide a form for an obligated party to indicate its election to meet its requirement. The form shall require sufficient information to determine the nature of the credits that the default delivery agent will be responsible to deliver if the obligated party elects to meet its obligation in part. Uh, the commission shall make such elections known to the default delivery agent as soon as practicable. The commission shall by rule or order establish a standard timeline under which the default delivery agent credit costs or costs are established and by which an obligated party must file its election form. The commission shall provide not less than 120 days notice of default delivery agent credit cost or costs prior to the deadline for an obligated party to file its election form. So an obligated party can assess options and inform the commission of its intent to procure credits in whole or in part as, for, as fulfillment of its requirement. So, um, when the default, when the commission sets the price to be paid to the default delivery agent, they have to give at least 120 days notice so that the obligated parties will know it well in advance how much those credits are going to cost so they can determine if they can do the work themselves or if they want to go to the credit market or if the, they want to use the default delivery agent. Representative Smith and then Tori. Thank you. Is there a possibility that once the company knows what these costs are going to be that they cannot afford it and may have to close? I don't know. Maybe. Potentially. Representative Tori. Yeah, my question is um, related to the rule or order that the commission will use to establish the timeline. Um, we haven't really had a lot of experience or understanding yet in the committee of the PUC <coughs> operates in the world. Um, so does that mean that the rule or order at this juncture would also be a proceeding that there would be hearings and there would be access, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, and just as a preview for the very end of the bill, um, this bill throughout makes reference to the PUC either adopting a rule through the formal rulemaking process, or um, they also, the PUC utilizes something called an order, which is a less formal process, so it's, 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 um, but in, in uh, substance would be similar. Um, and that's actually in the next section just discussed more. Um, but at the end of this bill, there is actually a freeze on the PUC actually adopting any of these, either of these mechanisms until the legislature gives its affirmative consent. 
Um, and so uh, this is what is going to be in the statute, but the PUC won't actually have this authority to do any of that specifically until the legislature gives its affirmative authorization. So this is setting up, and we'll talk more about orders shortly. Um, orders are a very specific process to what the PUC does, um, but we will definitely, to, and you should hear from the PUC about the types of um, processes and order when they use uh, with orders. Um, so <clears throat> number four, okay. yes, uh, number four, the default delivery agent shall deliver creditable clean heat measures either directly <clears throat> or indirectly to end use customer locations in Vermont sufficient to meet the total aggregated annual requirement assigned to it pursuant to this subsection, along with any additional amount achievable through non-compliance payments as described in section F2 of this section. <clears throat> so the, as I sort of was just mentioning, the obligated parties need to make their decision known to the PUC so that the PUC can go to the default delivery agent and say, okay, this is how many uh, parties want to use your services. Um, you need to be able to manage this workload this year. So on page 18, budget. The commission shall open a proceeding on or before July 1, 2023, and every three years thereafter to establish the default delivery agent credit costs or costs for the subsequent three-year period. The proceeding shall include an initial potential study con conducted by the Department of Public Service to include the quantification of available thermal resources, thermal market conditions, and statewide and regional thermal workforce characteristics. The development of a three-year plan and associated proposed budget by the default delivery agent and the opportunity for public participation. So this um, was added in Senate Natural um, later in the discussion. So this language is very similar to what currently happens for the efficiency utilities, efficiency Vermont. Um, so I do think you should hear from, uh, hear more about what goes into this um, potential study and how, uh, what types of um, things are calculated as part of it um, and how that is used to set the budget. Okay. That budget will then be a significant component of how much the credit cost. So that is one of the elements that goes into the price per credit that the PUC will set. Um, another uh, flag that, um, uh, I would just say that there isn't a, this says that this is a proceeding that's going to start almost immediately if this bill were to pass so that this, the department can start working on it. And there's funding in the appropriation section for this work. Um, there's no deadline on this um, potential study. Um, I don't know lo how long they, they typically take, but that, that may be something you want to consider is whether or not there needs to be um, a deadline by which that will need to happen. And the reason I say that, because we're going to talk about at the end, all of the deadlines in this bill, and there isn't one currently for this, but you may <laughs> want the potential study to be due so that you as a legislature can review it. So on page 18, number two, excuse me. Yeah, Representative Sebelia. Uh, as the bill is written now, uh, when would, what is, do you know when the date is that we would want to have this in order to, Review it uh, along with the rest of the world. I would say probably no later than January 1, 2020, or January 15, 2025, because that is when the PUC's um, big rule package is going to be due to the legislature. Um, I don't know how long they normally take, so it may be you can get it sooner. Um, but just off, that is when the final big rule package is going to come to the legislature for review. Great. Thank you. Uh, so number two, once the commission provides the default delivery agent with the obligated party's election information, the default delivery agent shall be granted the opportunity to amend its plan and budget before the commission. Compliance funds. All funds received from non-compliance payments under the prior section shall be used by the default delivery agent to provide clean heat measures to customers with low income. So this is, again, making sure there's always a dedicated fund of money for low-income work. On page 19, specific programs, the default delivery agent shall create specific programs for multi-unit dwellings, 
condo associations, renters, and for manufactured homes. So these groups have an equal opportunity to benefit from the clean heat standard. Section 8126 is related to rulemaking. So as I already mentioned, and we'll get to this again at the end, this is setting up a statutory section that would relate to rulemaking. Um, and while it says adopt, shall adopt multiple places, the PUC is not empowered to act under this section until the legislature gives affirmative consent. And we will get to that later, but just so you are aware. So the commission shall adopt and may issue orders to implement and enforce the clean heat standard program, but not until the legislature says so. <laughs> the requirements to adopt rules does not in any way impair the commission's authority to issue orders or take any other actions before and after final rules take effect to implement and enforce the clean heat standard. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but what's happening here is that there's going to be like one large rule document on the clean heat standard program. Um, but as we, you've started to see, there are multiple different components to this program. There's things related to developing the clean heat credit system and the clean heat credit market. There's also going to be uh, specific elements related to the default delivery agent, how entities will interact with the default delivery agent. So um, this section is setting up that there is going to be a large rule, but in addition, the PUC may, is just giving flexibility to have some of these individual components appear in orders, which the PUC can adopt more quickly than a standard rulemaking. <clears throat> so the commission's rules, may include a provision that allows the commission to revise its clean heat standard rules by order of the commission without revision being subject to the rulemaking requirements of free VSA chapter 25, which is the Administrative Procedures Act, provided the commission provides notice of any proposed changes, allows for a 30-day comment period, and responds to all comments received on the proposed change. Um, so this is setting up a basic order procedure that is um, much more streamlined than regular rule adoption, but does contain some of the elements. So there will be notice of proposed changes, 30-day comments, and then response to comments. Um, and this will be how the rule, uh, the rules, um, sorry, how the orders will be adopted. Any order issued under this chapter shall be subject to appeal to the Vermont Supreme Court under section 12 of this title, and the commission must immediately file any orders, a red line, and a clean version of the rules with the Secretary of State with notice simultaneously provided to the House Committee on, energy, on Environment and Energy and the Senate Committees on Finance and on Natural Resources and Energy. So on page 20, uh, section 8127 is on tradable clean credits. So the credits established. By rule or order, the commission shall establish or adopt a system of tradable clean heat credits that are earned by reducing greenhouse gas emissions through the delivery of clean heat measures. While credit denominations may be in simple terms for public understanding and ease of use, the underlying value shall be based on units of carbon dioxide equivalent. The system shall provide a process for the recognition approval and monitoring of the clean heat credits. The Department of Public Service shall perform the verification of clean heat credit claims and submit results of the verification and evaluation to the commission annually. So um, I don't think I have said this yet, but under the renewable energy standard, um, there's something called RECs, which I think most of you are familiar with, that represents the renewable aspects of an electric generation facility. Um, under this program that you're establishing with the clean heat standard, um, uh, new different credits are being established. They're clean heat credits, which re represent the amount of greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, these credits do not currently exist, and the PUC is going to need to create them as well as the system for how they're going to be um, monitored and tracked. Um, so this is a this is a, a new concept to the whole country. Oh. <clears throat> uh, credit ownership. The commission, in consultation with the technical advisory group, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes, 
shall establish a standard methodology for determining what party or parties shall be the initial owner of a clean heat credit upon its creation. The original owner or owners may transfer those credits to a third party or to an obligated party. So um, there has been a lot of discussion about this. Is it, the, is it the entity that pays for the credit? Is it the entity that owns the home where the credit is being installed? Is it some combination of that? Um, and so because these credits don't yet exist, the PUC, that's one of the things they have to sort out here. Credit values. Could you tell us who the technical advisory group is? Who, who, is that a offset or somebody off the PUC or? We're gonna get to it. Okay, okay. I think it's the next okay. section. It is gonna be a group of, of advisors, the expertise that are going to advise the PUC. So not members of the PUC, but we will talk about that. Thank you. Yep. And a similar group exists currently um, for the renewable energy standard. So it's the process that is being utilized in a different area of law. All right, thanks. Yeah. So credit values, uh, credit, uh, clean heat credits shall be based on the accurate and verifiable life cycle CO2E emission reductions in Vermont's thermal sector that results from the deliver, de delivery of eligible clean heat measures to existing or new end use customer location in Vermont. Um, so in these customer locations into or in Vermont. On page 21, for clean heat measures that are installed, credits will be created for each year of the expected life of the installed measure. The annual value of the clean heat credits for installed measures in each year shall be equal to the life cycle CO2E emissions of the fuel use that is avoided in the given year because of the installation of the measure minus the life cycle emissions of the fuel that is used instead of that emission. So if you picture a cold climate heat pump, what is the fuel use that was avoided minus the fuel that was actually used? You get a delta. So that number is um, the amount of emissions reduction. And so that's for installed measures like a clean, uh, an advanced uh, wood heating system or a cold climate heat pump or a cold climate or a heat pump water heater. So what is the difference? How many less emissions are there because that was installed? Does that involve well, Just to be clear, you don't, let's say last for, it's designed to last for 10 years. You only get the, in year one, you get only the credit for the avoided emissions in year one. Yes. And then, so each year, you continue to get, do you continue to get credits for the next? Yes, for the time? measured life of the product, yep. Okay, okay. So it works on a linear <laughs> basis, not all at once. Yes, and okay. so this area is very technical, yep. um, and there's some acknowledgement further on that over the measured life of something, is, and if um, multiple technologies are combined um, in the same home, uh, there will be differences over the useful life of the product, they will probably diminish over time, particularly if there are multiple things that are installed. And that's a good thing because that means there are less emissions overall. So for number two relates for measures that are fuels. So these are the two big categories. We haven't spent too much time on it because it's actually the next section, but there are two big categories of clean heat measures, installed technologies, or fuels. So for clean heat measures that are fuels, clean heat credits will be created only for the year that the fuel is delivered to the end use customer. So unlike with technologies that are installed into a house, a, a biofuel is going to only be burned once. So it's going to only count towards credit once. The value of the clean heat credits for fuels shall be the life cycle CO2 E emission <laughs> of that fuel use that is avoided minus the life cycle CO2E emissions of the fuel that is used instead. So again, um, uh, what this is setting up is that companies will have the option um, to blend biofuels into their, um, their fuel source so that their emissions are reduced that way instead of, or in addition to heat pumps. So the goal overall is to reduce the amount of emissions that are produced in the heating sector. So, um, 
We're going to look at in a minute some of the ways that you determine this, but if a, if a biofuel blend is going to produce less carbon, uh, less greenhouse gas emissions, that can be used as a clean heat measure. So D, less <coughs> list of eligible clean heat measures. Eligible clean heat measures delivered to or installed in Vermont shall include thermal energy efficiency improvements and weatherization, cold climate air, ground source, and other heat pumps, including district, network, grid, microgrid, and building geothermal systems, heat pump water heaters, utility controlled electric water heaters, solar hot water heaters, electric appliances providing thermal end uses. So on to page 22, advanced wood heating, non-combustion or renewable energy-based district heating services, the supply of sustainably sourced biofuels, the supply of green hydrogen, and the replacement of a manufactured home with a high efficiency manufactured home. Um, number 11 is a new one this year. So um, I think you have already heard and you'll hear more about that uh, manufactured homes um, have different uh, aspects to them that are different than other homes. And so this is saying if a, if a manufactured home is replaced with a high efficiency one, that could count uh, for credits. Representative Sebelia. Ellen, this is a list. So these measures shall be included, but other measures could also be added. Yes. Yeah. Yep. This is the baseline. And so one of the things that is going to happen, and we'll talk more about this in the next section, um, just because a measure is on this list, it's going to need to be evaluated for how much credit it is actually eligible for. Um, and so there's a couple different ways that this can come up. But if, for example, you hear about green hydrogen, um, I don't know how much clean hydrogen is actually being contemplated for use in homes, um, but there are different, the, the calculation will need to be done how much emissions reduction that it's actually going to lead to, and that will correspond to how much credit it actually gets. Maybe I shouldn't have called out green hydrogen, but any of these things, if um, they're not going to lead to emissions reductions, that's going to be worth zero credits. So they're on this list, but the technical advisory group, as well as the um, calculation consultant is going to review these types of measures and what kind of emission reductions they're actually capable of providing. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Who establishes eligible, eligible thank you, <laughs> eligibility? So this list here is establishing a statutory list. Um, and then I think there is, Somewhere in this section is another sentence that says that the PUC can consider other things to this list. So they would actually establish the PUC instead. Yes. Thank you. Yep. So on page 22, subsection E, renewable natural gas. For pipeline renewable natural gas and other renewably generated natural gas substitutes to be eligible, an obligated party shall purchase renewable natural gas and its associated renewable attributes and demonstrate that it has secured a contractual pathway for the physical delivery of the gas from the point of injection into the pipeline to the obligated party's delivery system. Um, and so this is a very tech, this is a technical requirement because gas is unlike other types of things. Um, you cannot guarantee where a molecule of gas is going to end up. So for a company that wants to use renewable natural gas, they're going to have all, they're going to need to have the contractual pathway. Um, and so in a, they're going to need to demonstrate that they have purchased renewable gas and injected it into their pipeline um, so that it is part of their mix. And they also need to um, have the attached renewable attributes. So the RECs demonstrating that it is renewably generated. Carbon intensity of fuels, subsection F. So this is a new concept in this bill this year um, from last year's bill. So to be eligible as a clean heat measure, a liquid or gaseous clean heat measure shall have a carbon intensity value as follows. Below 80 in 2025, below 60 in 2030, and below 20 in 2050, 
provided the commission may allow liquid and gaseous clean heat measures with a carbon intensity value greater than 20, if excluding them would be impracticable based on the characteristics of Vermont's buildings, the workforce uh, available in Vermont to deliver lower carbon intensity clean heat measures cost or the effective administration of the clean heat standard. I'm gonna keep reading and then I'll double back uh, so we go over this. Uh, so on page 23, section, subsection two, the commission shall establish and publish the rate at which carbon intensity values shall decrease annually for liquid and gaseous clean heat measures consistent with subdivision one as follows. On or before January 1, 2025 for 2025 through 2030, and honor before January 1, 2030 for 2031 to 2050. For purposes of this section, the carbon intensity value shall be understood relative to number two fuel oil delivered into or in Vermont in 2023, having a carbon intensity value of 100. Carbon intensity value shall be measured on, based on fuel pathways. So in this year, 2023, uh, number two heating fuel oil has a value, carbon intensity value of 100. <laughs> this is setting up that in order for your um, fuel to count as a clean heat measure, uh, starting in 2025, it would need to have a carbon intensity value of 80. And then it, that cap declines over time. So the biofuels used are going to need to have less and less emissions over time. Um, you're, you should hear testimony because I am not an expert in calculating carbon intensities, but there are states that are currently doing this, for example, Oregon, and the other states that are using the clean fuel programs for transportation fuels. Um, and so what I have heard is I believe that natural gas has a carbon intensity value of 80. Um, and so either heating fuel or natural gas that is blended with anything additional to reduce um, its carbon intensity value could then be eligible as a clean heat measure. And so this is setting up a statutory decline of 80 to 60 to 20. Um, and it's also directing the PUC to set up um, smaller steps along the way. <coughs> okay. On page 23, emissions schedule. So to uh, G, number one, to promote certainty for obligated parties and clean heat providers, the commission shall, by rule or order, establish a schedule of life cycle emission rates for heating fuels and any fuel that is used in a clean heat measure, including electricity, or is itself is a clean heat measure, including biofuels. This schedule shall be based on transparent, verifiable, and accurate emissions accounting adapting the Argonne National Laboratory GREET model, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC modeling, or an alternative of comparable analytical rigor to fit the Vermont thermal sector context and the requirements of 10 BSA, 578A, 2, and 3. So, as I just mentioned, um, Oregon, Washington, California, and maybe Colorado have all adopted clean fuels programs for their transportation fuels. Um, so si I, this system in S5 is a little bit different than that, but their systems do um, look at the carbon intensity of the fuel and how much emissions each fuel type produces. And so what they use for that um, to calculate those values is the Argonne National Laboratory's GREET model. So this is directing that the PUC is going to adapt the GREET model to then be able to set an emission schedule so that um, people know how much emissions each fuel type produces, which will then lead to knowing how much um, emissions need to be reduced. Um, and so just so you know, the GREET model, the T in GREET stands for transportation. Uh, and so that's why we need to adapt the model because currently it is set up to calculate the emissions for transportation fuels. So we'll need to change some of the variables um, and change the math a little bit to adapt to heating fuels. Um, but there is already a body of work um, that can be built on using those models as well as the IPCC models as well. So this is setting up, we're gonna to need to establish this um, model so that we can calculate 
how many emissions are generated by these types of fuel, which will then lead to how much needs to be reduced. Representative Sebelia. So, Ellen, uh, back in three. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I want to make sure that we're clear on this. So, uh, that's a one year period of time in three that number two fuel oil would be eligible for credits. So, they're not eligible for credits, but it is establishing that number. Counting as a measure, right? It's so we, not counting it as a measure. It's using by way of example, number two fuel oil, which is your basic heating fuel, has a carbon intensity value of 100. Mm -hmm. The first year in this bill is 2025. The program probably won't be operating in 2025, but it will be well under development. To be eligible um, in 2025, it will need to be 80. And so that's a lot lower than fuel oil. So, uh, Fuel oil will not be able to count. Something blended with fuel oil that gives it a, a carbon intensity score of 80 would potentially count. So it's using 100 as a baseline just so there's a known number. Okay, so on page 24, so uh, number on page four, subsection two, for each fuel pathway, the schedule shall account for greenhouse gas emissions from biogenic and geologic sources, including fugitive emissions and loss of stored carbon. In determining the baseline emission rates for clean heat measures that are fuels, emissions baseline shall, be, shall fully account for methane emissions, emissions reductions or captures already occurring or expected to occur for each fuel pathway either as the result of local, state, or federal policies that have been enacted or adopted. So in order to calculate the, the carbon intensity of a fuel, the fuel pathway will need to be known. So what are all the inputs in the system? Uh, what is the, um, the exact uh, fuel source, a makeup of the fuel, um, the extraction process? Um, so all that information is going to be known, including the biogenic and geologic sources. And I think you heard a little bit about the, the differences in those already. Um, um, and including any fugitive emissions. Um, and so the baseline is going to include any methane emissions reductions that are required by state, local, or federal law. Um, and so the example I have heard is if um, met, uh, methane gas from landfills um, if there's any required state or federal policy that requires um, that work to be done or flaring, that's going to count in the baseline and is not going to count as an eligible clean heat measure or is going to be reduced by the amount that's already required under state or federal regulation. Number three, the schedule may be amended based on changes in technology or evidence on emissions, but clean heat credits previously awarded or already under contract to be produced shall not be adjusted retroactively. And so this is one of the things that's looking towards, there may be changes in technology that are gonna to need to be um, uh, updated in this, uh, in this uh, work. So that needs to be kept an eye on, but uh, things that have already been awarded shall not be retroactively adjusted. Uh, subsection H, review of consequences. The commission shall biennially assess harmful consequences that may arise in Vermont or anywhere else in the implementation of clean heat measures and shall set standards or limits to prevent those consequences. Such consequences shall include deforestation, conversion of grasslands, damage to watersheds, or the creation of new methane to meet fuel demand. So um, I think you may hear more about this, but this was added by Senate Natural um, because there, have, there was testimony related specifically to the use and the increased use of biofuels. Um, biofuels that are grown or produced elsewhere may have consequences potentially including deforestation or conversion of grasslands. So the PUC does have to um, review some of those impacts biennially, which means every other year. Um, and decide if they need to make adjustments based on information related to that. Subsection I, timestamp. Clean heat credits shall be timestamped 
for the year in which the clean heat measure delivered emission reductions. For each subsequent year during which the measure produces emission reductions, credits shall be generated for that year. Only credits that have not been retired shall be eligible to satisfy the current year obligation. So a clean heat credit will have a year on it and it can only be retired once. Um, you can hold on to it longer, but you can only retire it and therefore count it towards the annual obligation once. On page 25, subsection J, delivery in Vermont, clean heat credits shall be earned only in proportion to the deemed or measured thermal sector greenhouse gas emission reductions achieved by a clean heat measure delivered in Vermont. Other emissions offsets wherever located shall not be eligible measures. Um, so there are existing programs in the country related to carbon offsets. Those are not gonna be eligible measures. This is really specific work done in Vermont. Credit eligibility, all eligible clean heat, <laughs> clean heat measures that are delivered in Vermont beginning on January 1, 2023, shall be eligible for clean heat credits and may be retired and count towards an obligated party's emission reduction obligations, regardless of who creates or delivers them, and regardless of whether their creation or delivery was required or funded in whole or in part by other federal or state policies and programs. This includes individual initiatives, emissions reductions resulting from the state's energy efficiency programs, the low income weatherization program, and the renewable energy uh, standard tier three program. Clean heat measures delivered or installed pursuant to any local, state, or federal program or policy may count towards both goals or requirements of such programs and policies and may be eligible clean heat measures that count towards the emission reduction obligations of this chapter. So what this means is that um, the part of the intent here is to allow uh, individuals to combine incentives, so to stack programs. So there are existing incentives out there. There are existing state programs that require certain work to be done. So any of those, any of the work that meets the definition of a clean heat measure, um, even if it's required by another program, can be eligible for clean heat measures. And um, this means that people can combine multiple incentive sources to buy down the cost of a clean heat measure. So number two, uh, the owner or owners of a clean heat credit are not required to sell their credit. Hang on one second. Okay, okay. It's, I'm sorry, go ahead. He had to, okay. he needed to hit yeah. pause for a moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> totally understand. Um, and, and part of the reason there is, uh, other programs aren't necessarily looking at whether or not something is going to generate a clean heat measure. You know, um, tier three is is doing is asking utilities to do similar work to the clean heat program, but for a different reason potentially. Um, sim similarly, with low income weatherization program, so we know that a lot of this type of work is already being done: weatherization, installation of heat pumps, um, and so it's giving credit for that work that's already being done and you further leveraging those incentives. Representative Tory. So, is that something that you like? The like who handles that integration for a particular transaction? So this is setting up, and I think so there's probably a little more in credit. Yeah, so there's there's gonna be a credit market. So the DDA will have some um, part of this work, but um, anyone, uh, so if, for ex so if any work is being done in this section um, by the existing energy efficiency programs, um, that work could count. And um, based on when the PUC decides who owns a credit when it's um, installed, um, they'll be able to sell that credit on the open market or directly contract with a, a fuel importer who needs credits. Um, so, you know, the Senate Natural Resources contemplated whether or not there should be an open market or whether or not it should be centralized with the DDA. Um, and they wanted to have an open market so that there was that flexibility so that people could sell their credits. 
that way. Representative Pat. And just to follow up in the discussion I had with Ellen during, during the break, if the uh, community action agency run on the low um, uh, the weatherization program, there is now a credit value of whatever that, that ends up being for their work, which is additional income to the community action agency for the weatherization program. So I see that as a good thing. Uh, so subsection two, the owner or owners of a clean heat credit are not required to sell their clean heat credit. So if they generate it and they, they want to hold on to it themselves, they are allowed to do that. Page 26, regardless of the programs or pathways contributing clean heat credits being earned, an individual credit may, only, may be counted only once towards satisfying an obligated party's commission <laughs> reductions. Uh, re emission reduction obligation. So again, a, a one credit can only be retired once. It can only count towards an obligated party's obligation once. Subsection L, credit registration. So the commission can create an administrative system to register, sell, transfer, and trade credits to obligated parties. The commission may hire a third-party consultant to evaluate develop, implement, maintain, and support a database or other means for tracking clean heat credits and compliance with the annual requirements for obligated parties. The system shall require entities to submit the following information to receive the credit, the location of the clean heat measure, whether the customer or tenant has a low income or moderate income, the type of property where the clean heat measure was installed or sold, the type of clean heat measure, and any other information required by the commission, Customer income data collected shall be kept confidential by the commission, the department, the obligated parties, and any entity that delivers clean heat measures. So again, this system doesn't exist currently, but the PUC is going to set up this online system uh, so that people can buy, sell, trade, uh, so that uh, the obligated parties know where to go to look for credits. Uh, subsection M, greenhouse gas in, uh, emissions inventory and forecast. Nothing in this chapter shall limit the authority of the Secretary of Natural Resources to compile and publish the Vermont greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast in accordance with 10 BSA 582. And in fact, all of this very specific data will hopefully help them have more precise data in the inventory. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that intense walkthrough that got us here. Yeah. Two thirds. Page 27. Yeah. Um, with that, we will break for lunch and find another time to reconnect with Ellen to finish the walkthrough. Thank you all.